Um, so we're blessed today to have Pastor Bruce and Melody visiting us uh, for the weekend from Calgary. Yes. <laughs> Is Melody give us a little wave if anyone hasn't met Melody? And you'll meet Pastor Bruce in a moment. Um, many of you guys have known them. And we, you guys, Bruce and Melody, we're so, so thankful for you. Everyone here is. Uh, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you guys. <laughs> and the truth is that um, God has used you more than you know. Because he is so good. In 2016, Pastor Bruce and Melody felt the call of God. Maybe they felt it before that, but they came out here in 2016. And actually, they were obedient to the call of God to leave all and move to Regina to take a huge step of faith and start this Jesus-centered, verse-by-verse church plant. And Bruce actually let me know the very first uh, pre-service, they had a little Bible study with Deb and Ruth and Bruce and Melody was the first Sunday of July, five years ago, today. Isn't that crazy? They also felt the call of God two years ago, knowing that the Lord was calling them back to Calgary specifically to help Pastor Glenn at RMCC. And Bruce and Melody have been used by God in mighty, mighty ways in Calgary. And we miss them every week, but we know God is using them and God is keeping us connected to them. And I personally am so thankful to Bruce and Melody for helping me um, step up in my calling uh, to become a pastor and in our family to, to take this step of faith in our lives. Thank you guys for all you've done for us. And you know what? There's so much more we could share about the story. There's uh, pages and chapters and volumes of what God has done in just these five years. Um, the truth is we are here as a lighthouse in this city to make disciples, to share about Jesus, to go through his word and stay faithful to his word, and to not just see people converted, but really discipled, to, to become followers of Jesus. And that's all because of the groundwork and the ministry that was laid uh, by Bruce and Melody and by those who came around them and supported them. And there are many of you here today. So we're very thankful and we're super excited. And I've asked Pastor Bruce to come and share with us today as the Lord has led him. If you have a Bible today, you can grab that open. And um, there's going to be one bookmark I'll tell you about now so you can find it and put a, a marker in there. And that is Hebrews chapter 11. And that way you can find it quickly during the study. Hebrews 11 is our bookmark. And then Colossians chapter 1 will be our study. Colossians chapter 1. Now, Colossians chapter 1. And, uh, you know, uh, for uh, Calvary Chapel, the Calvary Chapel movement, what distinguishes Calvary Chapel from, uh, you know, denominations and uh, many and most other churches is that uh, uh, Calvary Chapel teaches the Bible uh, systematically uh, expositionally and enthusiastically. The idea is that we would see the Word of God implanted on the hearts of the people of God. Now, every once in a while, uh, there's an exception where uh, some stranger uh, comes and, uh, and uh, gives a little teaching. And so today, uh, we're not in Genesis. Uh, so we're taking a time out from the systematic teaching. And we're going to just take a little a look at the, uh, at the book of Colossians. Thanks. <laughs> so Colossians. There are 66 books in the Bible. And uh, so how do you pick one of 66? And then how do you pick a particular chapter or verses? And, but there are 66 books in the Bible. And all of them have, uh, you know, the same theme. Essentially, uh, the Bible introduces us to God and introduces us to the idea of uh, his uh, redemption. Uh, the Bible is uh, God's redemptive revelation uh, to humankind. So they all are brought together to have one theme, but then each book has its own little uh, emphasis, if you will. And in Colossians, 
uh, a very strong emphasis, one we're not going to talk about today, but a very, very strong emphasis out of Colossians is the deity of Jesus Christ. The fact that uh, Jesus is God the Son, the second person of the Trinity. Very, very significant. If you ever have somebody maybe knocking on your door, I think probably soon we might have some people, again, post-COVID, people knocking on their door, and uh, they want to tell you about their religion and this exalted angel. Uh, well, uh, the truth of the matter is, uh, he's far, far greater than an exalted angel. Jesus Christ is God the Son, forever to be worshipped as God, the second person of the Trinity, and that's a main theme of the book of Colossians. Now, as I said, we're not going to cover that main theme. We're going to cover a secondary theme, and that secondary theme is uh, Paul, who didn't know the Colossians, hadn't been to Colossae, uh, but had heard about them. And so he's writing a letter to them, very specifically to encourage them in their faith. And so uh, this morning, I had told Pastor Colin a week or two ago that uh, I thought that, uh, you know, the Lord was saying, teach Colossians uh, chapter 1. And, uh, and then this morning, uh, Colin texts me and he says, so what's the title uh, for your message? And, uh, uh, you know, I'm looking at the telephone and the title for the message. And uh, that kind of threw me off a little bit because uh, I hadn't thought of a title. And I don't think in the times that I've ever taught the Bible, I've ever had a message. I ever had a title. I uh, may never have had a message either. I don't know, but that's another thing. But uh, anyway, uh, Colin says, what's the title of your message? And so, uh, you know, actually it was fairly easy because it's about uh, the encouragement that God wants to give us in our walk and relationship with him. And so that's a major emphasis of the book of Colossians. And uh, that's what we're going to really be looking at as we study this book together. So, now, when I think about uh, CCR, and uh, lots of things come to mind, of course, uh, but uh, when I think about CCR, I do think about the people who would come and visit and, uh, you know, maybe stay but come and the first, you know, the first time they come and first impressions are, are you know, significant. And uh, so uh, oftentimes Melody and I would be so incredibly blessed because uh, people would come and uh, they'd say, you know, uh, what's, you know, it's kind of different about your church. What I like about your church is that uh, uh, everybody seems to love every, everybody. There seems, there seems to be a lot of love here. And uh, I thought, wow, okay, uh, you know, that's not a bad first impression. <laughs> and, uh, you know, gee, 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 give God the glory. If uh, people are experiencing some love, uh, then hallelujah, praise the Lord. But the idea is that uh, here we are in Colossians, and uh, Paul wanted to encourage these believers, and uh, specifically he wanted to encourage them in their walk and relationship with the Lord, and all that that meant, the fruit that that produced including and perhaps most especially the love that they would have for Jesus, but then the love that they would have for other Jesus people. So it, Colossians, uh, let's uh, look at uh, verses 1 to 14, and uh, we're going to read those verses, and then we'll dive into uh, what we believe uh, God is saying to us through these verses. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it also as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us uh, your love in the Spirit. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience 
and long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the domain or power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Let's stop there. And we'll go back and uh, just go through these verses together, starting in verse 1. So we see that Paul is addressing this letter uh, to the uh, uh, believers, to the church in Colossae. Now, Colossae uh, was located in what is today modern Turkey. And as I said before, uh, you know, Paul wrote uh, lots of letters, uh, lots of books in the Bible, lots of the letters in the New Testament written by Paul. And, uh, you know, the idea is that uh, in each case, uh, the, we believe God was inspiring what was being written and so we read these today as God's word. At that time, if you're a Christian in Colossae and uh, you get this letter and uh, you, you know, you're not thinking, oh, this is part of the New Testament. You know, no, that's not really crossing your mind. You're thinking about this man named Paul who maybe you've heard about and uh, he's got something to say to you. And so, you know, you're kind of all ears. What does Paul have to say to us? And so here we are today believing that just as the Christians in Colossae would have been very attentive to hear what uh, God through Paul would say to them. We want to hear what God through Paul would say to us. It's, just, it's that simple. Now, uh, let's just look at a few things here. Uh, the, the apostle, now the apostle. The apostle basically meant just he's a messenger. He was called by God, uh, very specifically called by God to be a messenger, or an ambassador of the good news. And there were 12, very specifically, there were 12 apostles. Uh, one of those apostles, Judas, uh, went a different route, committed suicide. And so there had to be a, a 12th person brought into that uh, group. And this is, uh, how, this is how we know Paul, called to be an apostle. And the story of Paul is very interesting because, of course, he violently opposed uh, Christianity and the Jesus movement. Uh, but then one day, and you know the story, as I say, and all of a sudden, this persecutor of the Christian faith becomes this great promoter of the Christian faith. It's an amazing story. So here we have uh, Paul, and it says Timothy. And so Timothy, a young man who uh, has come alongside Paul to kind of hold up his arms, co-labor with him in ministry. And the idea is that uh, Paul, with Timothy's help, maybe Timothy actually wrote the words. That's what Melody does for me when I'm uh, given out a preparing for a message, and uh, I'm not a very good writer, and I can't think and write at the same time, but Melody is able to do both, and so Melody helps me uh, get the words down on paper, and so Timothy probably helped Paul in that way. Now, it says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Colossae, and uh, the truth of the matter is, you know, we don't use that word saint. Everybody here who's a believer who's asked Jesus to be their savior, you're a saint, Technically speaking, according to the Word of God, you're a saint. Now, that nomenclature probably is not something that we use today, uh, although uh, in, the, in the Catholic Church they do have saints that are, are you know, the real respectable Christians, the real special ones. Uh, well, in, 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 in the times that the Bible was written, the t New Testament was written, the truth is, if you just ask Jesus to be your Savior, you are a saint. And so that's who uh, Paul is writing to here, not the ones that are somehow really special, really respectable. He's writing to everyone who has bowed their knee to Jesus and said, Jesus, please be my Savior. These are the saints, the faithful brethren. Now, uh, as we think about uh, the idea of um, uh, Paul writing to them and saying in this, uh, in this introduction, basically, uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, this, was, this became for Paul a very standard greeting for him in all the letters that he wrote. And so on the one hand, it was just a standard greeting, you know, the way we might, you know, uh, start off a letter, you know, dear so-and-so, how are you doing? You know, and we probably don't even care how they're doing. We just, that's how it's what we say, you know, how are you doing? Uh, so on the one hand, it was a standard greeting. On the other hand, it was a very, a very sincere prayer that uh, these ones would receive from God grace, peace, and oftentimes in other letters, mercy. So here we have the Apostle Paul with a very sincere prayer that God's uh, blessings, favor would be grace, would be upon these ones, and that they would also be enjoying uh, his peace. 
uh, some tranquility, if you will. And so let's now look at verses 3 to 5. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it also is among you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. Now, Paul says in verse 4 here that he's heard He's heard about these believers in Colossae, uh, this city, uh, and now he wants to write to them. He's heard about their faith in Christ Jesus and their love for all of God's people. So in verse 5, he references their confident hope in what awaits them in heaven. So in these verses, Paul is commending them for their commitment to their faith. The idea very specifically is that he commends them for their faith, their love, and their hope. Now allow me to say something about faith, love, and hope. And, uh, uh, you know, this is really deep. You know, faith, love, and hope. Where have you heard that before? No, anyway, bear with me. We're going to talk a little bit about faith, hope, and love. So first, Paul commends them for their faith in Christ Jesus. Now, faith uh, is a belief, or better maybe stated, a moral conviction that we have. What faith isn't is uh, believing something in spite of the evidence. Faith isn't believing something in spite of the evidence. And you might hear that from those who have yet to receive Jesus the Christ as their Savior. Faith is a moral conviction, but it's not believing in something that otherwise there's no evidence for it. And that's why I asked Colin to direct us to Hebrews chapter 11, because In Hebrews chapter 11, we actually get a definition, a biblical definition of what faith means. So, faith, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So, in these two verses... We have this definition of faith. And for me, uh, the key words are substance and evidence. That becomes particularly important as we think about what Paul was commending these ones for. He was commending them for their faith. Well, their faith in Jesus Christ. But what does faith actually really mean? So what it means in terms of Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 3, is that there, in terms of our belief, there is actually evidence for the historicity of this man called Jesus the Christ, or Jesus from Nazareth. There is historicity for this man. And beyond the fact that he existed, that he lived, there's historical evidence for his life, his miracles, his death, burial, and then his resurrection. There's historical evidence for Jesus. So, uh, what type of evidence? Now, I'm not going to go into much detail. But the truth of the matter is, there's lots of evidence. And the idea is that, uh, so for instance, uh, we have uh, manuscript evidence that tells us about uh, this man, Jesus. And so when we think about the manuscript evidence, uh, we think about the letters that were written, for instance, uh, uh, the apostles, uh, the, but uh, the ones who wrote the, the, uh, the, 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 the Gospels, I should say. And uh, in the case of the Gospel of John, uh, there is very early manuscript evidence In fact, uh, about 100 years dated manuscripts, uh, papyri dated about 100 years after the life of Jesus. And so that's very substantial. Now, why do I say that's substantial? Well, because, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, if you want to get a degree at a secular university in political science, uh, which I happened to do uh, about 40 years ago at the University of Regina, I got a degree in political science. And if you want to get a degree in political science, the secular uh, philosophers and uh, professionals, you know, really, really smart people, they'll tell you you need to learn about Plato. You need to learn from you know, what Plato wrote, the Republic. And uh, brothers and sisters, they don't doubt the professors, the smart people out there. They don't doubt that Plato existed. And they don't doubt that he wrote something called the Republic. Well, the oldest manuscript evidence for the book called The Republic 
is 1,500 years after we believe Plato lived. 1,500 years after Plato existed. The manuscript evidence for Jesus, 100 years after he walked on this earth. And so the idea is, you're talking to someone who has some doubts, and, uh, you know, while well, Jesus, who knows? You know, yeah, well, pardon me. But the idea is that the evidence for Jesus and the fact that he existed, he lived, he did what we say he did, is far greater, far greater than anyone else in history, in past history. And that's just the truth. And that's just part of the evidence. There's incredible archaeological evidence that proves the historicity of the Bible, the truthfulness, the veracity of the Bible, of scriptures. And then there's tremendous uh, prophecy, evidence of the historicity or the veracity, the truthfulness of the Bible as a result of prophecy. And one such prophecy has to do with Israel, as an example. And the idea is that we have these Dead Sea Scrolls that have been identified as having been written over 2,000 years ago. And in those Dead Sea Scrolls, among other books, including Isaiah and Zechariah, we see uh, what's written about Israel and the fact that uh, uh, Israel is going to continue throughout history. Israel is going to be there in the last days, but the Jewish people themselves will not be particularly loved or cared for, liked too much. We have these predictions. And then what happens in AD 70? The Romans come and they, they, they displace all the Jewish people out of Israel. Israel is no longer a country. It doesn't exist. And it doesn't exist for 1,900 years. The Jewish people are scattered around the world and everywhere they go, they're hated. And the reality is they should have uh, integrated into the populations where they were. They should have just become like the Hittites and the Canaanites. You know any Hittites or Canaanites? No, you don't. Because what happened? Well, there, there are people that just vanished off the face of the earth. And that's exactly what should have happened to the Jewish people. If you're talking about logic and reason, that's exactly what should have happened to the Jewish people. And then there's no country known as Israel for 1,900 years. And then one day, the United Nations signs a decree, a decree that there's going to be a country called Israel. And subsequent to that country being on the face of the planet, again, what do we see? We see a country that's hated by all the nations around it, has been a cup of trembling for the nations around it, including up until 1947 and beyond that, but what, 1940 and what happened with Hitler. And six million Jews were killed for what reason? No reason whatsoever. But you can't, brothers and sisters, you can't write that 2,000 years ago. You cannot write that 2,000 years ago, and it was written much more than 2,000 years ago. But secular scientists looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls will tell you what they found was at least 2,000 years old. You can't write those types of things 2,000 years ago and have any hope that the detail of those specific prophecies could possibly be fulfilled. And yet, brothers and sisters, that's where we are today with Israel. So anyway, I got off track. You've forgotten how I got here. We're talking about the fact that there's evidence. There's evidence for what we believe, and it's very, very strong evidence. So evidence leads to a verdict, so to speak. And the verdict is that Jesus Christ is, was, and is who he says he was. Amen? Amen. Now, whether you come to faith in Christ through looking at the evidence, and some people do, or you come to faith in Christ like a lot of people do, and that is... Uh, uh, you just get convicted of your sin and uh, someone gives you a message, you hear a message and you say you're feeling guilty about your sin and so you should, uh, but I got good news for you. You know, Jesus Christ died for your sins and all of a sudden you find yourself, you know, tears coming down your face and uh, believing and receiving God's forgiveness and you know that you know that you know that something's happened that you can't possibly explain. So whether you come to faith in Christ through looking at the evidence or whether you come through faith in Christ just through a supernatural act of the Holy Spirit of God, the reality is we have faith. So first of all, Paul commends these ones for their faith. And that's what I want to do here this morning, is commend you for your faith. It's not a small deal. No, it's not. It's actually a huge deal for which all of us every day should be saying, thank you, Jesus, that I believe. Now, Lord, as it happens, I could ask that you would help my unbelief 
But we thank God for his faith. Now, second of all, the faith that he's given us. Second of all, Paul is commending these ones for their love for one another. Now, the love Paul was talking about had a very specific meaning. And I only say that because the truth of the matter is, brothers and sisters, the word love uh, probably has become uh, quite a platitude for the most part. You know, in everyday conversation and communication, you know, you can say, oh, you know, I, 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 I love you. And the person you're talking to, they can't possibly even know what you mean when you say that. Now, I'm not talking about moms talking to little ones, and we have some little ones. Praise God for the little ones that have been God's brought to our church. But, uh, uh, you know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the, 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 you know, the normal everyday use of the word when we say, you know, oh, I love you, and well, you know, whatever, what does that mean? Well, Paul has a very, very specific meaning when he uses the word love. It's not a platitude. And this is what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know the verses. You don't have to turn there. Love has a very specific meaning. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Brothers and sisters, the type of love that God wants to give us for others, specifically one another, is very specific. It has a very specific meaning. And we want to embrace that love. We want to acknowledge that, for the most part, in our own fleshly, sinful nature, we don't know what biblical love is, and we certainly can't exhibit it. We can't show it. We can't have it. It's not possible. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, the grace of God, in the name of Jesus, we can love like God wants us to love. And that's what Paul was doing here. He was commending these ones for the fact that they had that kind of love for one another. And praise God, that kind of love could still exist today against the backdrop of all kinds of things that we won't get into. But that love can still exist today. And praise God that that love is here among CCR. Again, amen? amen. So Paul commends them first for their faith, second for their love, and then third for their hope. Now, these believers had a, an eternal expectation of something that was going to be a whole lot better than what they knew in their time-space continuum. Much better things awaited them. And so it is for us, brothers and sisters, that uh, we go through life with one eye on the here and now. Yes, we do. We go through life with one eye on the here and now. But we also should be going through life with one eye on the there and the then. And only God can bring those two things together. So that indeed, at any given moment, throughout our day, throughout every season of life, we can be very certain about what God's called us to do and have our backs in it, our hearts in it. But at the same time, we can also be hopeful about the fact that one day we're going to stand before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus the Christ. And by the grace of God, he's going to say to each of us, well done, good and faithful servants. Praise the Lord. So, in the opening of this letter, Paul commended these ones for their faith, hope, and love. And I want to personally just echo what Paul said now to you believers here in Regina. God bless you for your faith, love, and hope. Praise the Lord. Verse 6. Which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it, also, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. So, Paul says it's bringing forth fruit. And we ask ourselves the question, what was the fruit that was being brought forth? It's your, your faith, your love, your hope. It's bringing forth fruit. And that raises the question, what kind of fruit was being brought forth? So, on the one hand, you know, we're talking about the fact that faith, love, and hope is fruit itself. But on the other hand, we can look at faith, love, and hope as producing in us, first and foremost, a commitment to our walk and relationship with the Lord Jesus. So first of all, we're seeing uh, in uh, Paul's uh, letter here, talking about fruit, we're seeing the idea of Paul commending these ones and praying that these ones would be, uh, remain committed. He's commending them for their commitment, and he's praying that they would remain committed so, since the day that we heard the good news of the grace of God, which we understand is God's love for us through, on, through Christ's death on the cross, uh, these ones, we are committed to
to our relationship with Jesus the Christ. Now, among other things, that commitment does produce then faith, love, and hope. The fruit of their relationship with Jesus was their faith, love, and hope. But it also includes, it also includes their calling. And so let's look at verses 7 and 8. Paul goes on to say, As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Epaphras, our faithful minister. So the fruit, what is the fruit supposed to produce? So the fruit should produce the idea that we are all called to be faithful ministers of the good news. Now, Epaphras was obviously very instrumental in leading these ones to faith in Christ. But fast forward to us today, and the idea is that God wants to produce fruit in our lives, our walk and relationship with the Lord, including that we would be filled with faith, love, and hope, but also including the fact that we would be his faithful ministers or effective ambassadors for us. In other words, each of us are called by God, first to be saved, have our names written down in the Lamb's Book of Life first, but then secondly, each of us are called to serve the Lord. Yes, we are. We're called to do our part in shining our light and sharing our faith in this world, but we're also called to do our part in serving within the church. So Paul begins his letter by commending these believers for their commitment to their faith. But then he references the fact that each of them has a calling, and we want to remember that. So we want to remember we're, we've got a commitment. We've got a calling. We've got a commitment, but we've also got a calling. So it is for us today as believers. God wants us to be committed to our relationship with him, but he also wants to encourage us in our service or our calling uh, uh, of him. So regarding our calling, this is what Paul writes in Ephesians 4.16. Again, you don't have to turn there. He writes in Ephesians 4.16 that every part, and that's what we are, we're parts of the body, that every part does its share, which in turn causes the growth of the whole body. Let's keep going. Colossians 1, verses 9 to 10. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So Paul was uh, writing this note to encourage them and specifically to commend them for their commitment to encourage them in their calling, but then here in these verses, he wants them to be encouraged in their godly character. So the idea is that there's a commitment, there's a calling, but then there's this matter of godly character. Now, what is godly character and where does it come from? Well, godly character is being Christ-like. That's the probably simplest way you can put that. Having the character of God himself. And it comes from three things that are mentioned here in verses 9 and 10. And probably they're not restricted to where it comes from, but there are three things mentioned here in verses 9 and 10 that help us to have godly character. God desires us to have godly character. How do we get that? Where does it come from? So first, that we would be filled with the knowledge of God's will for our lives. So Paul is praying for these ones. And in his prayer, he says that you would be filled I don't cease praying for you since I heard about your faith, your love, your hope. I haven't stopped praying for you. What are you praying for them, Paul? I'm praying that they would be filled with a knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So how are we committed to the Lord? Well, first, we're committed to the Lord uh, by being filled with a knowledge of his will for our lives. God has a plan for our individual lives. Yes, he does. In praying this prayer in verse 9, we acknowledge that our plans for ourselves in our own fleshly nature, without God's help, without asking God, our plans for ourselves will never line up with God's plans for us. And so the idea is we take from this verse, uh, verse 9, a little uh, um, inspiration. 
and a great prayer for ourselves, a great prayer for our loved ones, a great prayer for one another, that we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the grace of God, the name of Jesus, would be filled, filled with a knowledge of God's will for our lives. And we pray that on a regular basis. Jesus himself prayed this. You remember the Garden of Gethsemane. And the night before, he's going to be crucified, right? And he's asking the Lord, well, maybe. And then he stops himself and he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And brothers and sisters, that's how we should wake up every morning. Fill me, Father, with a knowledge of your will. Godly character? You want to have godly character? We start off every morning by saying, Father, fill me with a knowledge of your will for my life. Amen? So we're talking about getting godly character. First of all, that we be filled with the knowledge of God's will for our lives. Second, that we would desire to be fruitful in everything we do. And so Paul is praying for these ones that that would be their case, that they would be fruitful in everything that they do. In other words, there's knowing God's will, knowing what God wants us to do, and that's the first prayer. Praise the Lord. God, fill us with the knowledge of your will. But then there's really caring about how well we actually perform God's will. And again, I don't know if you've heard, you know, the words uh, complacency, laziness, indifference. I don't know if you've heard of those words before. But uh, I must confess that, uh, you know, I have to battle that every day. And so what Paul is praying for these ones, what Uh, God wants for us is that we would be fruitful in everything that we're doing for the Lord, that we would really care. We'd set the bar high, very high, not because of our own abilities, not by strength nor by might, but by the power of the person of the Holy Spirit for his glory and in Jesus' name. So we would be fruitful, godly character. First, knowing God's will. Second, Second, having a heart to be fruitful committed to being fruitful. And then third, there's this matter of learning more and more about God's character himself, learning more and more about God, having an inc- or increasing in the knowledge of God. And of course, much could be said about that, but the main point is here that we would be spending more and more time reading God's word. God's word gives us a revelation of who God is and the ability to actually perhaps have that godly character that he wants us to have to be more and more like him, more and more like Jesus. Now, before we go on and complete our study this morning, we want to remind ourselves that God, through Paul, is encouraging these believers in their uh, commitment to him. Secondly, their calling that uh, he has for each of them. And then thirdly, in their character that he wants each of them to have. This is Paul's uh, desire in writing this letter. Their commitment, their calling, and their character. Now, fourth and finally, Paul is asking, God is asking us today, that in all these things, we would be very effective in our commitment, our calling, and our character. In other words, that we would do all things well. We wouldn't be indifferent. We wouldn't be relying on our own efforts. We'd actually want to do everything well. But again, knowing that but for the grace of God, that's not possible. So let's read verses 11 and 14 again. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now, these last verses remind us of where our effectiveness comes from. So God wants us to be very fruitful. And where does that fruitfulness come from? So where does our ability to have godly character come from? Where does uh, our ability to fulfill God's will for our lives come from? Where does our commitment to the Lord come from? So Paul, in verse 11, is praying that these believers in Colossae would be strengthened by the Lord, by his power, and specifically to have endurance, to have patience, to be able to run the race that God has set before them, God has set before us, and that in all things, 
we would do it well. We would do all things well. We would be good and faithful servants, even as it says here in verse 11, having joy in what we're doing. So Paul goes on to say in verses 12 to 14 that the reason we should care about our commitment, our calling, and our character is finally and most importantly because of what God himself has done for us. He has enabled us to share in the inheritance, or in other words, eternity in paradise. Put, put another way, or as Paul writes it here, God has transferred us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Verses 13 and 14. In other words, Paul identifies the motivation for them to remain committed to the Lord, committed to their calling, committed to godly character, and in all things committed to being effective. God's reminding them what's the motivation for all of this. The motivation for it, all of this is knowing what God has done for them, knowing what God has done for us. And brothers and sisters, once we really, really know what God has done for us, what would we not do for him? So Paul is encouraging these ones in their walk and relationship with the Lord. And this is not to get saved. And this is a small point, and all of you know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. This is not for them to get saved. Their commitment, their character calling, their character, their, their hope, their faith, their love, their hope. This is not Paul saying, this is what you need to do in order to get saved. No, these ones are already saved. And they're already saved because they made the simple confession. I say simple because, truthfully, it is pretty simple. The bar for salvation, brothers and sisters, has been set very, very low. Why? Because God does not wish that any should perish, but that all should come to a saving knowledge of himself. The bar has been set very, very low. All we have to do is admit the obvious. We're sinners. And then acknowledge that Jesus Christ died for sinners, and we say, I'm in. Thank you. Yes, please. That's it. The bar is set very, very low. So here Paul is talking to these ones, not to get saved, but because they are already saved. And he's saying to them, if you're already saved, if you're growing in an appreciation for what God has saved you from and saved you for, then the next thing is that you want to now live for the Lord. And he's saying, this is what that means. And what does it mean? It means they grow in their faith. They grow in their love. They grow in their hope. They grow in their commitment to the Lord. They understand their calling. And they're committed to having godly character. So, if you're here this morning, or listening, and uh, you have asked Jesus to be your Savior, you're part of the family of God. For which we say one more time, thank you, Lord, for that indescribable, how Paul wrote, indescribable, and it really is indescribable. But thank you, Lord, for that indescribable gift that you've given me. If you're here today and you've asked Jesus to save you, one more time we say thank you, Lord, for that gift of everlasting life. But at the same time, at the same time, we want to be regularly taking stock of where we are as Christians in our walk and relationship with the Lord. We want to be taking stock. And we want to be asking ourselves, where am I in terms of my commitment to the Lord? Where am I in terms of my calling? Where am I in terms of my character? We want to be taking stock. Not to get saved, but from the point of view of being saved and growing in our appreciation of what Jesus has done for us. And as we grow in our appreciation for what Jesus has done for us, we want to then be committed more fully. We want to be doing what God's called us to do, every part doing its share. We want to have that godly character that becomes light and salt in this dark world. Each of us needs help in our commitment to the Lord, our calling for the Lord, and our character that reflects the Lord. We do. We need help. And that help comes through praying and acknowledging the fact that but for the grace of God, but for the power of the person of the Holy Spirit, and but for the power that's in the name of Jesus, we're not going to have a commitment to our walk and relationship with the Lord. 
We're not going to know our calling or be wanting to be fruitful in that calling. And we're not going to have godly character. We're not. It's not going to happen. But through our prayers, for ourselves, for one another, God can work in and through us, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And what's God's good pleasure? Exactly what we've just been reading here in Colossians. In other words, none of us can say we've arrived. None of us can say that we are perfect in any way. But as Paul himself said, we press on to lay hold of all of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of us. Now, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, listening online, uh, maybe here today, and you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior, it is as simple as I said earlier. The bar is set very low. And the idea is that you acknowledge the obvious. And the obvious is that we're sinners. Our sin separates us from the love of God. But Jesus Christ has died for our sins, wants to save us. And it is as simple as saying, thank you, Lord. Please forgive me. I love the uh, lyrics and a line. Of a so- the lyrics, is that what we call them, Megan? Lyrics, a line and a song. And this guy writes, uh, please forgive me. I need your grace to make it through. All I have is you, Lord. I'm at your mercy. And that's a great prayer to become saved, but it's also a great prayer as saved people, as we acknowledge that we need God's mercy. So, brothers and sisters, there you have it. Uh, I am so grateful to you for welcoming Melody and myself uh, to be with you here this morning. And I do want to end by just simply encouraging you. Uh, You're here because you love the Lord Jesus. And he has great plans for you. I don't know all of you. I don't know where your circumstances are, but I know the word of God. And I know what he can do through a sinner. And I want to encourage you that you in your prayers would be asking the Lord every day to fill you with a knowledge of his will for your life and asking the Lord that by the power of the Holy Spirit you would be fruitful in every way, committed to your walk and relationship with the Lord, filled with faith, love, and hope to be about our Father's business, that people might even see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.